Well, welcome to another Friday night. We've been doing a deep dive into the 60 characteristics of complex trauma to understand each one in greater detail. And tonight we come to one of the sad characteristics, and that's those that have complex trauma, when they end up in a position of authority, they have a tendency to abuse their power or to abuse that authority. And I think it's key to say up front that not everybody with complex trauma will abuse their power if they get in a position of authority. But it's a tendency that happens to everybody and some give in to it. What happens if you have complex trauma is you experience the abuse of power. Those who are in a position of power over you, who are stronger than you, abuse that, and that's why you ended up with complex trauma. So complex trauma happens because of the abuse of power. It's so important to understand that. And so what happens in the child is they come to a place where they hate the abuse of power, they develop a heart for the underdog, for those who are experience, experiencing the abuse of a power. They get to a point where they never want to be like their dad or mom who abused their, their, their power in their life. But sadly for many, once they end up in a position of power, they end up abusing it themselves. Now, I don't want this talk to become a condemna condemnation type of talk. I don't want it to put you to a place of a lot of guilt. I want you just to be aware of this area and this potential in your life so that you can stop it if it's already happening or you can watch out for it once you arrive in a position of power. So let's, let's begin with a definition what we are of power. So power is the ability to do something. It is the ability to act. It is the ability to influence others or influence things. That's how we define power. Every person that comes into the world has inherent power. So you think of what looks like a helpless little baby when it cries, it influences its caregivers to come and take care of them. So that ability to influence its caregivers is power. So even a baby has the ability to influence. And so I think it's obvious for everybody, but power can be used in a good way or a bad way. It can be used to bless others or to harm them. It can be used for good or for evil. Now, I want to stop and just say this. People who abuse power, they are doing it to bless themselves. That's what they're thinking. I don't care if I hurt people. I am going to bless myself. But what they don't see is long term, they also hurt themselves. So in the short run, it might look like they're blessing themselves at the cost of hurting people. But in the long run, they hurt themselves, not just others. The next thing to see is that power is not always a felt thing. So you can have a whole bunch of power and not feel like you have a whole bunch of power, not even realize how much power you have. So you don't have to be conscious of feeling powerful in order to have power. And then power changes in the context. So you can be very powerful in one area, but have very little power in another area. So that's just a bit basic overview around power. Now there are different types of power. So we think of physical power. That's the one we think of most commonly. And so that's being physically stronger than others so that you can dominate them, hurt them. Then there's verbal power. It's the ability to use words to influence others. So you can use words to encourage, to build up. 
You can use words to sway people and influence them in their thinking. But you can also use words to mislead people, to coerce people to do what you want, to tear people down and to hurt them. So words have the ability to bless or to hurt deeply. They have power. Then there's emotional power. And it has two categories. Think of a person who gets very pouty. They sit there with their bottom lip sticking out. Believe it or not, that influences a whole bunch of people. Some people come running in order to make them feel better, to give them what they want. So you can use emotions and your emotional state to influence other people. But then there's the ability that some people have to stir up the emotions of others in order to influence them. So you think of a band that gets people all worked up emotionally and then they're just ready to do whatever the band says they should do. Or a politician or a preacher. They know how to use words. They know how to manipulate people emotionally and once they are worked up emotionally, they can get them to do what they want. And emotions becomes a very powerful way of influencing people. Then there's power that comes from knowledge. You go to a doctor or an expert about a problem and you do what they say. Why? Because they're an expert due to their knowledge. Then there's power that comes from position. A judge, a president, a policeman, a pastor, all are in positions of authority and that gives them a certain amount of power. Then there's the power that comes from reputation so that people don't even have to know you personally, but they still allow you to influence them because of your reputation. Then there's power based on fear. So when you get into the mafia, the gang world, people give you respect. People do what you want because they're afraid of what will happen to them if they don't. That's a lot of power. But there's also flip side, power based on having integrity, having character. So people just look up to you because of that and you have power of character. Then there's power based on your association with somebody else. So you're the president's child. You work for the king. You are a pastor who represents God. All of that association gives you extra power. So that's a lot of different types of power. Now one person could have all of those types of power or they might only have one of those types of power. It can vary based on the individual. Okay, having given that as an introduction, let me take to the abuse of power. And I think where we need to start with this is understanding those who have little power. We say they're vulnerable. And what the, the Latin word for vulnerable is, is to wound. And so somebody is considered vulnerable if they're susceptible to being hurt or attacked, if they're weaker than others. And so whenever power is used in a way that wounds vulnerable people or exploits them or because the vulnerable are trusting the person in power, that is called the abuse of power. So a person more powerful than a vulnerable person is now hurting them or exploiting that vulnerable person's trust in them, then the abuse of power has occurred. Now it's important to take this a little bit further. So <clears throat> a powerful person often will attract vulnerable people. And they will promise vulnerable people that they'll be there for them. They'll guide them and lead them to a better life, whatever they might say. 
But what happens after a while is the person in power can get frustrated with these vulnerable people. They're just a burden. They, they're not contributing the way the leader thinks they should. And so he sees them as an annoyance. They slow him down from accomplishing his agenda. And so those people, the vulnerable ones, now become resented by the person in power. And that then leads to abusing them, saying, I'm going to walk all over them because I have to reach my goal. And sadly, that happens a lot, and that is the abuse of power. So there's f five things involved in abusing the power. Number one, deception of self. Every person who abuses power lies to themselves. Every person who abuses power is self-deceived in some areas. And it goes like this. <clears throat> they believe that their mission is so important and so good that it justifies hurting people to get there. So that's how they distort and twist it in their own mind. But secondly, it also involves they have to deceive those under them to some degree. They have to get those people to trust them. So they will say, I am going to take care of you. I am going to lead you to the promised land. <clears throat> and they mislead them somewhat. Or they get these people to do their dirty work. They get these people to buy into it's okay to hurt people to get to this goal. So they have to deceive people in order to get followers. Thirdly, they then have to coerce people at times to do what they want, even though the people may not want to do it. So they will use fear. They will use guilt. They will use different manipulation tactics to get people to do what they want even if it means they have to violate their morals. Then you will find that they always operate by a double standard. So they want you to treat them a certain way, but they don't treat you the same. There's a double standard. And then what is fascinating to me is that people who abuse authority always talk about virtues. The virtues that a good leader would talk about, a healthy leader would talk about. They talk about love and respect and loyalty and honor. The problem is they twist the meaning of those words and give them a slightly distorted or a greatly distorted meaning. So what do they mean by love? They mean I'm going to love bomb you at first. I'm going to make all kinds of promises to you. I'm going to do all kinds of things for you just so that you will trust me and follow me. It's so I break down your defenses, but then I'm going to use you. And I'm not going to be really giving you unconditional love. My love has conditions. So they've twisted the definition of love. But then they twist respect and loyalty and honor. And now it means if you're a loyal follower of me, if you respect me, then you're going to lie for me. You're not going to rat me out. You're not going to make me face the consequences of my hurtful decisions. You're going to enable me to hurt people and get away with it. So they twist the meaning of virtues. And that can be very confusing to the people who are following them because they, they're made to think they're doing a good thing when they respect and honor and are loyal to the person when actually they're doing a very unhealthy thing. Some of the methods that they use to manipulate people. So they can't lead honestly by presenting the true agenda by presenting who they really are, they have to deceive and then they have to manipulate. And so 
The first thing that gets people into a position of power is they get promoted there. So they get promoted because of their job, because of their skill set, not necessarily because of their healthiness. Or they get married. They get a spouse. Now they are physically more strong than that other person. Or they become a parent. They now have children that they are more powerful than. Children who trust them naturally. And so they now are in a position of power just because they're promoted. But then others use means where they're just not naturally promoted there to gain a position of power. So they will use love bombing. They will charm you. They will flirt with you. They will give you gifts. They will make sacrifices for you. Also that you put them in a position of power. Or they will intimidate. They will use fear. They will use anger. They will just sheer force take over and dominate. That's another way to get to a position of power. Or they will blackmail you. They will find out some dirty secret about you and, it, and threaten to expose it if you don't do what they want. Or... They will threaten something you love. If you don't do what I want, I will hurt your child. All of those tactics get people to a position of power. And many of those ta tactics are used by unhealthy people to get to a position of power so they can abuse that power. Now, I want to just take a few moments to talk about the consequences of the abuse of power. I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but almost every evil in our society today is a result of somebody abusing power. So if you were to go over the genocide wars, what are the genocide wars? Somebody or a group of people abusing power, saying we're better than, and so we're going to get rid of them. Colonialism. We have a sad day and a sad couple of weeks in Canada where they've just again found more bodies at re residential schools of indigenous children. A culture that came in and said, we are going to make you speak our language, follow our religion. We're going to beat your language out of you. We are going to sexually abuse you. All of that abuse of power. And then slavery. All about the abuse of power. Today we have a major issue around human trafficking. Abuse of power. Kidnapping. Racism. All about the abuse of power. All about somebody saying, we're better than you, so we're going to mistreat you. And we feel justified in doing so. Then, patriarchy, which says, I'm the man, you're the woman, I can dominate you. You have to do what you're told. And all of the domestic abuse that has come out of that. Bullies at school who just use their physical power to hurt and dominate. It's an abuse of power. Rape and sexual abuse. In all cases, an abuse of power. Abuse within a family. Abuse that's physical, verbal, emotional. Abuse of power. And then you can look at the lack of justice in our society due to corrupt cops, corrupt judges, corrupt politicians that allow injustice to take place, that take care of the criminals and let them get away with it. Abuse of power. And then you look at abandonment, neglect of children. The people responsible to care for them aren't because they have another agenda. Abuse of power. So it is just horrific a Pandora's box of evil that comes is unleashed on society when there is an abuse of power. I want to take that just a step further to generational trauma. So if you were to look at 
kind of the slavery thing or the residential school thing, the initial trauma came from outsiders. Came from outsiders who tried to dominate those people and hurt them and abuse them. But if that person who was abused didn't have tools or opportunity to deal with that, to heal, to get to safety, they would carry around a whole bunch of anger. They would carry around a whole bunch of pain that would have to come out and they would start to lash out at those closest to them. And then the next generation, if they still haven't dealt with their stuff, now when they have children, they're going to start hurting their children. Go a couple more generations. Now you have the children with their children, the, their children with their children. And pretty soon what you begin to find is the majority of the trauma now is not coming from outsiders, it's coming from those closest to you. Somebody has said this, the worst that can be done to humans is usually done within families where there is generational trauma. And I see that all the time, and it is such a sad thing. Somebody else says this, Authority figures such as coach, ministers, or teachers are rarely perpetrators of trauma or abuse. These people often become the focus of high-profile cases, yet 90% of the time, the abuser is a family member or a friend. And so as trauma abuse becomes a generational thing, then the greatest damage is done by those closest to you, and that becomes complex trauma. Now I want to add one piece here, and that's this. Many leaders today, sadly, many people that get to positions of leadership are narcissists. People who want the power. People who want the prestige. People who want others adoring them. And so sad to me is this. We are, as a society, as I see it, are becoming more tolerant for narcissists as leaders. And what we tend to focus on is, but look at their talents. Look at what they can accomplish. But I go, wow, they might be able to accomplish some stuff, but the damage they do is horrific. And so what has happened, I think, in our society is when we evaluate leaders, we're not evaluating them as the main priority being they have to have healthy character. What we look for is their gifts, their ability to get things done, to accomplish goals. And as soon as we make that the main criteria, we set ourselves up to have a leader who's a narcissist who will eventually do a ton of damage. Now let me bring it to complex trauma and the abuse of power. And I've already kind of touched on this, I just want to begin to develop it a little bit more. Children are born with an innate trust for those in authority. That they're going to meet their needs, that they're going to keep them safe, protect them. When somebody in authority over them abuses that power, what they are doing is not using their power to bless the weak ones under them, to serve the weak ones under them. What they're saying is, I'm the boss, I get what I want, and you better get in line. And so that is the abuse of power that often happens within complex trauma, that the parent uses their position of power to be self-centered. Now, what happens inside a child who's growing up with the abuse of power? Well, you can imagine they're feeling rejection. They're feeling that the, this person doesn't want to try to understand them. So they feel very alone, misunderstood, hurt. But then they're angry at how they're being treated. They're, they're experiencing injustice, 
anxiety, depression. They feel at times it's their fault, so they must be a bad person. Shame. All of that is going on. And so what is happening in this child is they love and hate their parents at the same time. There's this growing split inside of the child that still loves them and wants a relationship with them, but is developing a resentment and a hatred towards them. And so what a child then will do with all of that hurt and anger inside is really dependent on the child. Some children will begin to act out right away. They will find kids at school who are weaker and bully them. They will hurt animals. They will hurt objects. They will punch things, write on things. Then some who can't do that because they're not strong enough physically, they develop a heart for the underdog. They're there to protect those who are abused. They begin to take up causes to protect people from bullies and the abuse of power. They bend over backwards to take care of pets that have been abused. Others vow, I will never be like my dad. I will never be like my mom. But sadly, what happens for many is they end up becoming their dad. They end up becoming their mom. And it is such a painful thing when they realize I've become an abuser of power. So the question I ask is, why did they, when they hated the abuse of power, end up abusing power? So let me give you some reasons. And they come out of complex trauma. So the first is, it's just the... The way that we grow up and are influenced by our environment, by what is our normal. We are influenced by our parents. So a child that sees dad use his power to get his own way. Dad, who when a child is defiant, instead of trying to understand the child, just says, you better smarten up and respect me and do what you're told. They're absorbing all of that. They're developing brain circuits that correspond with how mom and dad handle situations. And then when they grow up and are in a position of power, they just go to that place in their brain. And they start, without even realizing it, acting the way their dad did, responding the way their mom did. It's just the power of a parent's influence in shaping a child. But there's a second reason. What happens for a lot of people in complex trauma children is they have to run around trying to take care of the parents. Dad's angry. I need to go and make him happy. I need to do extra chores. Mom's sad and depressed. I need to run around and do stuff for her. And so they become the parents and the children, the parents become the children. And so here are the children not able to explore life, not able to be curious and just enjoy life and be carefree. Now they are super responsible. They have to give up their needs. They have to make sacrifice after sacrifice to take care of this family. And without realizing it, what happens for many of them is when they finally get in a position of authority, they go, oh, finally I can take care of me. Finally, I can live out my childhood and do what I want. And without even realizing it, they now use their authority to be selfish. All because they didn't have a childhood. And then there's a third reason that comes out of complex trauma, and that's shame. So a person with shame is afraid of being exposed for how weak they are, for how bad they are, for how not valuable they are. So they like to hide. So when a person gets to a point of leadership or having power, if somebody challenges them, somebody disagrees with them, that triggers their shame. Uh Uh-oh, people might see I'm a fraud. People might see that I don't have what it takes. So they go to, you better do what you're told. I'm the boss around here. 
and they abuse their power. But it's really a shame issue. Or they're afraid to ever admit they're wrong. They always have to be right because they think if they admit they're wrong that people will see them as weak. That's a shame issue that comes out of that. Or for some of them, when they were growing up and their shame was triggered, they felt humiliated. People laughed at them. People made fun of them. And, and so to show weakness meant humiliation. And so now if they admit they don't know how to do something or that they were wrong, they're afraid that they're going to get humiliated. Now what I want you to see is in their mind, they don't understand the difference between hu true humility and humiliation. Because for them, true humility means you admit you're wrong, but always in their mind that meant then you're going to get humiliated. And so they resist true humility, which I should say is a key ingredient for not abusing power, but they resist true humility because they're pretty sure it's going to result in getting humiliated, which again is another shame issue. Another thing that comes out of complex trauma is that often children in complex trauma have no control over their environment. There's chaos, there's abuse, there's neglect, and they can't do a thing about it. So when they finally get to a position of power, now they can control their world. And they get a taste of how good it feels to control their world that they become addicted to that power and never want to give it up. And so they abuse their power. For some, to get to a position of authority can awaken narcissist tendencies that have been there all along but have never had an arena or opportunity to express themselves. But now in a position of power, Something triggers narcissistic tendencies. So now, position of power, you say, I'd like to do this, and everybody says, okay. And you go, wow, I like the feeling of that. And then people naturally respect you because of your position. They obey you. They do what you want them to do. And then you ask them to do favors. And they do favors for you. They make sacrifices for you. And all of a sudden, you realize, you know what? They're doing 90% of the sacrificing, and I'm once in a while 10% sacrificing, but I kind of like this type of relationship. That's a narcissistic tendency. And then when things go wrong, oh, I can blame somebody else, and nobody disagrees with me. And so for some people, without realizing it, they get to a position of power, and it's like another person starts to come out that is very unhealthy, and ends up abusing power, and they didn't even see it coming. So let's go to healing. How do we change this? Because if you've grown up in complex trauma, you've grown up with the abuse of power, you know how hurtful it is. You've experienced all those hurts. Most of you aren't going to want to do that to your children. Most of you are not going to want to do that if you're in a position of leadership in an organization. So how can we have power but use it to bless and not hurt? So first of all, I hope you realize you have to, again, heal shame. Because as long as there's shame, a position of power will probably be abused because of your shame issues. So keep dealing with shame. Secondly, grow in humility. True humility with safe people always results in connection, in growth, in healing. So grow in humility. People need a leader with humility. And that is the way that you prevent the abuse of power is to have true humility. Third, if you get in a position of power, stop regularly and ask yourself if there are any double standards happening. Are you expecting people to treat you with respect but you're not treating them 
with the same respect? Are you expecting people to make sacrifices for you, but you're not making the same sacrifices? And are you being patient with the most vulnerable? You realize that if you are working with people who are coming out of complex trauma, people who don't have a whole lot of healthy tools in their toolkit, their growth is going to be similar to that of a toddler. It's going to be messy. It's going to be slow. And they're not going to be able to run as, <coughs> as fast as you. And so you have to be patient with them in that slow, messy process of growth. And if you're not, then there's a double standard and you're going to be hurting people. Next, have someone in your life that you respect, that you're accountable to about your leadership, about how you use power. Somebody that can get in your face if you are operating by a double standard or abusing power in any way. Next, if you're in a position of power, take time to get to know the people under you. That is so important. Many leaders just want people to obey them. But people don't want to obey, obey you unless you care about them. And the way they know you care about them is that you get to know them. It is so key. Next, consciously do things to sacrifice for others, to serve others, so that you never get to a point where it's just people serving you and you don't serve anybody. And then consciously have times when other people disagree with what you would like to do, that you do what they want, not what you want. That prevents the abuse of power. And then regularly do a self-evaluation on not whether you're attaining your goals, but how well you're doing at serving those under you, at caring for them, at meeting their needs. Often, leaders just do evaluations on, have I met my five-year plan? No, do evaluation on, how am I doing at loving the people under me? Well, that's the end of part one. I hope it helps you. I hope that as you grow in your recovery, and as you move into volunteering and service, that this will help you not fall into abusing any power. We're going to take a short break and then we're going to come back for the Christian part. If you're not interested in that, not a problem. You're free to go. We'll see you next Friday for everybody else. I'll be back in just a minute. Okay, welcome back. We've been going through the life of Peter, and today I want to just kind of do a parallel to what we've been seeing in Peter's life, just to fill out your thinking a little bit further. What we've been seeing is that God has said to Peter, Peter, I want you to basically start a new religion, but it's going to be different than the Jewish religion. The Jewish religion has become quite distorted. It's not having the priorities that I designed it to have. So I want you to lead this new religion in a new direction that's in keeping with my priorities. And so that has been what Peter has done. And, and the parallel to us today is that when you're in recovery, you're coming out of a life where you're headed in one direction, but now you're going to go in a new direction. And like Peter, you're going to get up some opposition. Opposition from family even, opposition from people, friends that you used to be with, but there will be some type of opposition. And then for some of you who are entering into a relationship with God, 
And as you grow in that relationship, you might have people who are saying, I don't like the direction your life is going. And you will get opposition for that. So what I want to do is go back to the book of Job. And Job is referred to in the first chapter as the most godly, righteous man in the whole world. And, and it's important to understand that because it's God's evaluation of Job, that there's nobody more righteous than him. Well, Satan comes along and he concludes that the reason Job follows God so wholeheartedly is because God has made his life easy. God has blessed him with so many wonderful things. And he's convinced that if all of those good blessings were taken away, that Job will go, I'm not going to follow God anymore. And so God gives Satan permission and he loses, Job loses everything. His wealth, his health, his children, it's all gone. After a period of time, it becomes obvious that Job isn't going to turn from God like Satan thought he would. He's not going to curse God. He's still loyal to God, even though everything in his life sucks. Now, here's what I want you to see. The beginning of the book, chapter 1, that's about Job losing everything. The end of the book, Job gets everything back. He refuses to turn against God, and God gives him twice as much back. And that's the story of Job. But that's only two chapters out of the book. Job has 42 chapters. There's 40 other chapters, and you go, well, that then must be the focus of the book. So the rest of the book, the 40 chapters, is about Job's four friends who come initially to comfort him. And they're godly people. They love God and are following God. So here's the big picture of it. Those four friends grew up in a society that basically thought they had figured out Job's situation and why it was happening to him. And their explanation was this. If you obey God, God will bless you. If you disobey God, God will send bad things and it, life will be painful. So Job, before you were the wealth, wealthiest person around, you had all kinds of blessings, that's because you were following God. Now you've lost everything, and now you're in tremendous pain. Man, you must have done something terrible against God. And in their mind, that makes sense. And so that's how they're looking at Job, is you have done something terrible, Job. And they, in their thinking, that was the only way to look at this. They were rigid in their thinking. And they were going to try and fit Job into that box. They thought it was the only correct interpretation. And so if you look at that belief system, I'm going to call it a box. It's their way of looking at things. Okay, so let me stop and say this. Most people in complex trauma families don't realize that their family is in a box. There's a set of rules. There's a way of looking at things. There's an understanding about the world, about life, and that's the box. And everybody in the box agrees with that system. Many churches have a box. And that's their way of understanding the world, their values, their morals, their rules. That's their box. Sadly, for most complex trauma, that box becomes rigid. And for some churches, that box becomes rigid. They think it's the only right way of looking at things. It's their right. There's nothing that needs to be changed. And so if somebody comes along and they are outside the box. Their experience doesn't fit within the box. Their belief doesn't agree with the box. Then what happens? What you would hope is that they would say, maybe we need to rethink our box. Maybe we need to evaluate our box. But sadly, that usually doesn't happen. And that's what happens with Job's friends. Instead of saying, 
Job, your experience, you're saying you haven't done anything against God. You're saying that you don't fit within the box that we said that good equals blessing, bad equals God taking away your blessing. You say your experience doesn't fit the box. We're not going to reevaluate our box. You're wrong. And so what the rest of the book is, is them starting very kind and nice to Job and explaining, Job, you must have done something to sin against God. That's why all this bad stuff is happening. And Job says, no, I haven't. Then they go a second round and they get a little bit more cruel. Job still says, no, I haven't done anything. Then they go a third round. Job says, no, I haven't done anything. Fourth round, they're trying to force Job into the box. And and because Job is refusing, and with his integrity, he says, to, to agree with their box, they then go not to evaluate their box. They now attack Job. And they say the nastiest things to him. They accuse him of the ugliest possible things, all because he would not fit their box and they refused to evaluate their box. So let me take this to kind of today and bring it into a Christian context. As Christians, we live in a world where kind of a tendency for most people is there's no absolute truth. It's whatever you want it to be. Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. And Christians come along and say, no, there is absolute truth. And we have to hang on to absolute truth. But from my observation, what I think I see is that they miss a couple of things, assumptions that they're making in doing that. So in saying we have to hang on to absolute truth, Many, without realizing it, are saying we have to make everything black and white. We have to be black and white about this subject, this subject, this subject, so that there's absolute truth. And that is extremely dangerous. But they think they can kind of twist the Bible to make it support making everything black and white. But then the second thing that happens is... They hear a preacher say, God says this, this is absolute truth. And they assume that that's God's meaning and don't see it's just the preacher's interpretation. And so God isn't necessarily saying that at all. It's just the preacher misinterpreting or giving his interpretation and making it sound like God is saying that. And so then they end up with these beliefs, absolute beliefs, but now they have to make it rigid. It's got to become a box. And what they're made to think is, if anybody challenges these beliefs, they are drifting from God. If anybody steps outside the box and says, hmm, I'm not sure that's as black and white as you're saying, well, they must not be as committed to God as you are. They must be drifting from their faith. And so adhering to the rigid box becomes the mark of devotion to God. So now nobody can challenge the box. And if somebody comes along and does that, people aren't going to evaluate the box. They're going to condemn that person. And that help is happening all the time. And so a system gets established where people become rigid, they close their mind to any other way of looking at things and now think, I have to stay loyal to this box or else I'm not loyal to God. And for some, once they have that box, they might have a little inkling in their gut that something might be a little bit off here, but they, they can't challenge the box. Because if I'm wrong about this one thing, I might be wrong about the whole box, and then what's going to happen to my faith? So I better hang on to my rigid little box. And so that's the world Peter grew up in. 
The religion of that time was a rigid box. Peter stepped outside of that box and began to challenge it. And they did not examine the box to see if it was right. They condemned Peter. And so God was asking him to step outside of a rigid box. And it was going to be the experience for Peter that Job went through. People who used to be friends now come to try to change him, his mind to get him to go back in the box. And when he refuses to, they turn against him. And some of you are going to get that in recovery. You're going to get your family, when they realize you're stepping outside of their box in order to get healthy, who are going to try and bring you back into the box. And when you don't come back in, they're going to turn against you and be cruel to you. You might get that from church if you step outside of their box. So sadly, the tendency of humans is to create boxes. And when somebody's experience doesn't fit it or they challenge it, instead of examining their box, they condemn the person who challenges it. But sometimes following God means stepping outside of a box that isn't as healthy as it should be and walking alone, facing opposition from that box. And if you're going through that, I just hope Job's experience and Peter's experience will kind of validate what you're going through and encourage you in your journey. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these experiences in the Bible that just show the tendency of humans. And it just helps those who are trying to walk a new healthy way to feel that others have gone before them and that they get what they're going through and that you understand it as well. And just strengthen them and encourage them, I pray. Amen. Well, thank you again for being with us.